Hello Dumaguete, hello Negros Oriental, and hello Silimanians around the world. On behalf of Ronald and Faith Vailoses No, this is Joshua Soldivillo, and you are watching Hashtag Siliman. For Hashtag Siliman updates, Siliman University received the Director's Award from the Department of Health as a key partner in supporting and contributing to health reforms and addressing social determinants for health, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Congratulations, dear Siliman. The Siliman University College of Engineering and Design produced 59 civil engineers who passed the November 2022 Civil Engineer Licensure Examination administered by the Professional Regulation Commission. Congratulations to our newly registered civil engineers. Meanwhile, Dr. Deli Pigo, an outstanding Silimanian awardee was recently recognized by the Philippine Nursing Association of New Jersey as their 2022 Humanitarian Awardee during the association's 46th annual Gala and Awards Night last October 29 at the Pines Manor, Edison, New Jersey. Congratulations and keep up the good work. Congratulations to the College of Nursing for a 100% passing rate in the recent nursing licensure examination with 126 takers in the November PNLE. Congratulations to the fifth placer, Angela Claire Nicolau Quetane, ninth placer, Vaughn Joseph Serna, and the tenth placer, Amari Joy Samson. Silliman University is one of the top one performing nursing schools in the Philippines during the November 2022 PNLE. To God be the glory. That will be all. See you next week for another set of Hashtag Silliman Updates. Good evening, everyone. This is a program initiated to discuss matters concerning the campus by the sea. And you're watching Hashtag Siliman. Maying gabi sa tanan. Thank you for joining another episode of Hashtag Siliman. We are so happy because we are here right now at the Institute of Environmental and Marine Sciences, particularly in their very popular Whale Bone Museum. This is part of our um, series as we feature the academic program offerings of Siliman University. True to its vision, we are a leading Christian institution dedicated no, for the total human development. And of course, that's for the well-being of society and environment. And of course, Silima University is much known for its thrust and zero on zero waste management. And of course, it stands. Um, especially against um, the reclamation. And in fact, we just recently declared a climate crisis. So this conversation is a very relevant one that you shouldn't miss. And I'm so happy to introduce to you our guest for tonight's episode, no less than the director of the Institute uh, of Environmental and Marine Sciences, we have Dr. Janet Estacion. Good evening, Dr. Estacion, and Good welcome evening. to the program. Good evening, everybody. All right, ma'am, can you share briefly to us uh, some information that you can um, tell about the very location that we are in right now? This is the Marine Lab Whale Bone Museum. So yeah. uh, can you share some, some facts about, about this yes, building, how this room? Yeah. Okay, this room is actually an annex of the other room. Mm -hmm. um, this was, I think, the newest addition. Uh, plus Earth Island, um, because we needed more funding for, you know, the lights mm -hmm. and the shelves and everything else. And so, um, but this collection over here is a collection over the years mm. um, that was started by Dr. Luella Dolar. And um, um, she and her husband, Dr. Perrin, were, pre were, you know, coming here every year and they were doing um, a lot of the marine mammal research. Actually, Luella, Dr. Dolari, is the pioneer of marine mammals research here in the here Philippines. In, uh, not only the in Siliman, but in yeah, the Philippines. In the Philippines. Um, and so um, that's why uh, through her efforts, um, it was, you know, the number of species in Tanyan Strait was mm -hmm. actually known, and so that led to the um, the dec its declarations as a NIPAS or what we call a National Integrated Protected Area. Yeah, so it seems, ma'am, that in your sharing, uh, the institute has a rich history and definitely mm -hmm. are part of its highlights. So this is kind of a personal question, ma'am Janet. Um, how long have you been with the institute, and um, can you share to us? 
to us why did you choose to um, be in this profession okay first question so um, um, I actually started coming here um, when I was undergraduate student mm, okay. um, but let me backtrack a little bit to your second question as to why cho I chose this profession yeah Actually, when I came over to Silliman, I did not ch choose this profession. Really? <laughs> uh, I actually enrolled as a nursing student. Wow. Yeah, and... Um, Definitely when, will not ask the year. <laughs> yeah, don't ask the year. Um, but essentially, when it was coming to the point wherein I would have to do um, duties, hospital duties. This is not on your fourth year as a nursing no, student? No, it was like on the second, second year, year, sauna, okay. you know, somewhere there. But it was leading to that, that, we were going to lead into that, you know, and so I was sort of freaking out already. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was claustrophobic oh, and okay. trying to think about being enclosed in four walls mm -hmm. uh, most of my life, um, I really, really freaked out. And so um, my second choice from high school was actually um, foreign languages, which was not offered there in Silliman. And I wanted to continue in Silliman. My third choice was actually marine biology. I see. Which is quite surprising because I come from a place which is, you know, without reefs. Mm -hmm. And so I only recognize three kinds of fishes. Tuna. <laughs> Tuna. Tamarong. And bangus. Okay. <laughs> How about tilapia, ma? Uh -uh. No tilapia. <laughs> Not that familiar. <laughs> no. Okay. And I only know crabs and shrimp. Shrimp. So I had very li limited knowledge, but still I sort of, you know, when I was already in biology, then that's when the interest sort of... And then when you finished the degree? I finished the degree. By then, I was already involved with um, Marine Lab then. Mm. That was the former name. Um, the marine lab was actually established by Dr. Alcala in 1978, so you know how old I am, some sort. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, there was, this started then, and then we had, um, they had little projects, and then they had big expeditions with the Smithsonian Institution. Mm -mm. And so I was with the second expedition, which was um, in 1979, and it was a very good experience for us, particularly with young divers, because we were diving uh, yeah. two to three times a day and stuff like that, as well as interacting with scientists. And so by then, um, I, I um, met already Dr. Kalumpong and um, um, expressed my interest to actually sort of volunteer in here. All right. So I was coming every, every free time um, and helping, you know, uh, in doing the dirty things, cleaning the <laughs> tanks and everything yeah, part else. Part of the job. <laughs> yeah. And then I was her assistant during the field work. So mm -hmm. we were just riding her motorbike, going to Shaton and everywhere else. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. But it was rough then. You know? yes. And then afterwards, um, I, I went for my master's for um, marine biology at uh, UPM, UP Diliman. And then I came back. And then when I came back, um, we actually had uh, occupied the second building, which were, used to be the soybean factory. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, this building was the other building, the adjacent building rather, was actually abandoned, um, mm -hmm. then we started to occupy it. Um, mm -hmm. this, that building is actually a um, feeding center for the community. Um, of, you know, it was an extension program of mm -hmm. uh, Silliman. And when they abandoned, then we just so came in and moved. the building. Yeah. Wow. So it seems that uh, <laughs> the journey, Dr. Janet, was, um, how do you call this one, um, unexpected, you know, because there was like a 360 degree turn from uh, nursing. <laughs> nursing to becoming into a part of the family of the IMS. So, um, right now, um, we know that uh, scientists, not only in the Philippines, but all over the world are uh, deemed to be ma contrabida when it comes to <laughs> developments, when it comes to um, what, we, what, we, what we would say as, uh, you know, um, progress, so on. So, uh, Ma'am Ma Janet, <laughs> what do you think are the common misconceptions about the people in your field, particularly those who are into environmental science, into marine <laughs> biology? Um, 
do you think this is much more on the need to educate more the, the people, mm -hmm. our government, or or they know but they just chose to what? What is what is your take on this, Doctor Isashon? Um, actually, I'd like to you know um, um, correct the misconception yeah. uh, regarding uh, contrabida among yeah. scientists because uh, um, there's a deeper understanding, kasi. Mm. Um, we always believe in what we call sustainable development. Right. But personally, um, I admit that for us to exist in this world, we have to destroy something. Yeah. But we have to minimize it, and we have to sort of, uh, you know, uh, plan wherein mm -hmm. our our impact is m minimized. No. Right. And that's why there's a great panic about climate change and everything, as yeah. if, you know, the climate will change tomorrow. <laughs> um, because when you look at it, um, when you look at the geological history of the world, you see that there are several glaciation periods which yeah. occur, occur millions of years. Right. And so um, it's like you're creating a lot of drama in the issues. Yeah. You sensationalize. You sensationalize. Yeah. And so... Um, everybody now is going for, you know, zero emissions. Right. And when you think about it, our technology still cannot, you know, provide the energy for zero em emissions. Definitely. So yeah. it will take some time. We will get there. But, you know, no, do not sort of go the other way. Yeah. And uh, create a lot of, you know. So definitely our scientists have a critical role in maintaining that sustainable development. Yes, right. and also we sort of look at it from a more holistic, holistic point approach. Of. But sometimes their colleagues are very, I you know, but that I was just saying for myself. Yeah, sure. You know, um, I realized that um, we usually look for alternatives first before we destroy yeah. something or propose something. Definitely. And so if it's not really needed, then why, why do so? Why do we do so? <laughs> yeah. You know? So, um, and, and that is also one of the, I think, unique and distinct characteristics of Silliman education because aside from the theory that we teach in the classroom, we really make sure we walk the talk, right? So let's talk about now the academic programs that your institute, uh, institute is offering. Mm -hmm. So you have your graduate programs and you have your undergraduate yes. programs. What are your academic offerings, Dr. Estacio? Um For the graduate programs, we actually have... Um, masters in environmental science, mm -hmm. which I previously mentioned were a bit freezing right now, um, but we still offer masters and PhD in marine biology. Um, we also, for our undergraduate, we have a uh, bachelor's in environmental science and a bachelor's in marine biology. So. Um, Dr. Istashan, we know that there are interconnections of these disciplines, but what do you think is the border between uh, marine science or marine biology and environmental science? Is it safe to say that marine biology is a subset of environmental science or there are two distinct okay. um, disciplines? There are actually two distinct disciplines, but um, to backtrack a little bit, no? All these applic um, like marine biology and environmental science, they're offshoots of mm. the, na the natural, natural sciences, sciences, which is you know physics, chemistry, and biology. Right. So uh, before everybody was like PhD in biology, um, but the 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 specialization it's like becoming more specific. Like it like for for example, if like I myself I have a PhD in zoology. Wow. But my thesis is actually on pathobiology of giant clams. So it's now going to marine. And so I I looked and studied the marine environment, the marine organisms mm. and stuff like that. And so if you look at my specialty um, I can teach the general subjects, but my main focus would be marine organisms. I see. And so that's uh, marine biology, which is different from marine science. Because marine biology, you look at the organisms. Environmental science. And environmental science is actually looking at the environment. All right. So you're looking at um, how um, different populations, for example, impact the environment. Mm -hmm. So your main concern is the environment. Right. And so that's quite different from marine biology. Although a marine biology special 
specialist would actually can do environmental science work. Yeah, so I, I think that's also one of the, um, I think, uh, how do you call this say, uh, or how would you say this? I think that's also uh, very appropriate given our marine uh, context because we're an island and then of course the philippines is uh, one of the i think if not the richest one of the richest uh, countries in terms of uh, bio marine biodiversity so um let's talk about dr station your research agenda so because uh, if you google the name of dr <laughs> janet <laughs> You'll see a lot of publications and articles, and of course, collaborations with Dr. Alcala, Dr. Mai Pen, of course, her colleagues. What are your um, research uh, priorities right now? Uh, for the Institute. Um, right now, we're working with um, um, basically more on um, like the fisheries, which mm. is uh, under the USAID project. Okay. Um, that's more or less looking at uh, governance then uh, with some research, particularly on mangroves mm -hmm. uh, and stuff like that. And then um, the USAID project is ending in uh, next year. And we have the zero waste uh, project um, under Dr. Emmanuel, which actually looks at um, how the Sari Sari store at that level, mm. how much do we contribute the to, thingy thingy culture. Yeah. yeah. You know, like um, you buy Toyo before you bring your Five container. Peso, yeah. Now you put in a plastic, plastic. bag. So right. it, that kind of thing. Is, wow. You know. So how much how much do we generate from the packaging? And because all these actually... I might say I'm guilty of that. <laughs> like yeah. the shampoo. Yeah. And the, yeah. the sachet, sachet culture yeah. and stuff like that. And so, um, even here in at Ames, we I, we sort of in, impose um, what we we are talking about. Like for example, garbage. So our students, you know, you can prevent them. They want to get all this um, food panda and grab yeah. food, you know. <laughs> and so I'm horrified at the amount of plastic and non-recyclables that they bring about, Absolutely. bring in. Right. So I tell them, you bring your basura home. So Not you will here. realize how much basura you are generating. Um, and so we, we sort of, as you said, walk the talk, you know. So we, we encourage our students, like, um, I, we do not sell, you know, bottled, bot, bottled waters, yeah. in plastic water uh, in bottles. Here, uh, plastic water, plas water in plastic bottles, sorry. Yeah. Um, here, and so... Um, the students are forced to actually bring their own water bottles. And so somebody teased me that the starting kit for our <laughs> students is actually short pants, okay, casual clothes, um, slippers. All right. And of course, you know, your a drink. Tumbler. A tumbler. Not a tumbler, but a thermos. A flask. A flask, <laughs> okay. yes. And so, um, as long as you have that, then you should be all right. All right. But Dr. Estacion, considering uh, your students, they also have other subjects that they have to take at the other side of the campus. Main campus. <laughs> well, uh, how, do you, how do your students manage to transport from the institute, from, from this point of the university, to, let's say, to the gym, if they have PE classes, or to Auseho Hall? What we do is that we actually try to group Mm. Like, for example, you have GE classes, mm -mm. then all the GE classes will be almost the same, I know, like um, MW or M uh, Monday, Thursday, whole morning. They will so have to stay at the main they, campus. Yeah. Which I actually encourage them to, you know, um, can you actually try to uh, be, I know, um, uh, exposed to the Siliman culture because yeah. we're so isolated. isolated here. <laughs> so that's what we do. That's right. So um, we're just going to take a short break, uh, Dr. Sashan, but when we come back, let us talk about um, your extension programs that you have been doing to serve our communities because here in Siliman, we believe that service learning is not only a community-based activity but also a pedagogy where our students will have to learn no? concepts and other theories. All of that and more when Hashtag Silliman returns. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're still watching Hashtag Suleiman. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, still with us is the Director of the Institute of Environmental and Marine Sciences, no less than Professor Janet Estacion. Dr. Estacion, um, before we took a short break, I actually asked you about what are the community extension programs that the Institute does and do you have like a yearly activity that you do? Do you do coastal cleanups? Talk about more about this. Okay. Um, before community, you know, involvement or was part of, you know, the mainstream, um, Marine Lab then was already doing that. Mm. Um, we would because like, for example, we go to the islands, then yeah. we talk to the locals. Um, du during the orientation for for establishing the Sarang Marine Sanctuary Marine at Apo, mm -hmm. at Balikasag Island, you know, um, it was the it was the um, this was led by Doctor um, Doctor Delphine, and so it was an extension program because you were already talking to the individuals. I remember that. Um, long before, they used to go to Apo Island and have free movie showing every Fridays. Oh. Yeah, under Dr. Cadilina. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Siliman actually has a long history of extension. Um, with regard to um, the Institute, we started because it, it has to go hand in hand. You just cannot do, do, it um, alone. do an research alone without talking to the community. Yeah. But and Dr. Estacion, when, when you do community um, outreaches and then you also do research at the same time and when you try to have a connection with the locals, um, how do you, what, what is the approach of the institute? Because if I would be like a local, wow, a scientist is coming over here and then what are the scientific names are they talking about? So <laughs> no, <laughs> what is the approach to, of the institute? Actually, when you we go sort to the of, the first thing is we go to we at least try to see whoever has a connection mm, okay. in the area, and then we try to have an orientation sometimes if we're, we know nobody from there. And then we try, we reach out to the local government units, okay. you know, um, send them a letter first, then informing them when we are coming, what we're going to do, and do a courtesy call. Right. So it's call. it's one of the most dip difficult part of our job. It's all we want to do when we reach an yes. area is go to the sea and then study the. Yeah, the and there are, we are waiting for you know the mayor <laughs> to arrive from right. another meeting, and you do the same for the barangay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we also have to connect with the barangay. So um, it's a show. It, it's a sign of respect. And sometimes they would require that we have some sort of an, an echo seminar. Mm -mm. And so we get, gladly give the echo seminar so that people will also be aware. Um, and sometimes we have validation for like the data set mm -mm. that we have. Um, like uh, once in Kamigin, we wanted to know what was the local knowledge. So they were gathered together and we were asking questions and you know where where are your mangrove areas and where are your so seagulls? they also become your partners yes in in, in yes. the research and we, we validate their knowledge so when they say that's a seagrass area we go and jump and in and validate yeah so it seems doctor station that you have combed the area here in the region in terms of our marine resources and mm -hmm. of course the, the nearby regions can you share to us an experience that you will never forget Lot. in your research works like one that really stands out that oh my gosh i'll never forget about this <laughs> i think it was when i was young <laughs> you still look young <laughs> and i went to it was my first like expedition okay. we went to kalawit island um, in, for, for in, the benefit of our audience ma'am can you share where is kalawit island? kalawit island is actually located in palawan mm. and it's the northernmost um, in northern area and this was the area that was uh, vacated to have all the exotic animals Ooh. you know giraffes and yeah. zebras yeah. and everything and we were asked to survey it so Dr. Alcala actually led the trip and um, I was the only female in the trip and so they had to protect me because they were afraid that there's going to be pirates you know and stuff oh like that oh my goodness and so the guys were really very accommodating, being part of the, you know, the whole process. But it was the, 
the difficulty of the travel that was actually, you know, building a character. <laughs> because we were all divers and yet we were wearing life vests. Because the right. waves were huge. Oh my gosh. And it made you respect, you know, your companions. Because you had to trust them yeah. to bring you to the next island. Because we were just island hopping. Imagine we were traveling in a motorized boat. Yeah. From Dumaguete all the way there. And to we, Palawan, like yes. the Kalawit Island. Yes. Oh and we goodness. were hopping from island to island. Wow. And we did not have a freezer. <laughs> so they had to catch fish for us to eat. What we had was just um, salt, um, a little bit of panakot, and rice. Mm -mm. That's it. The rest was from the sea. And so, um, you know, it was like you respect whom you are with because when you're actually, that's why we always build that thing in with our students, that it's, you have to work as a team. Miss, you cannot, you know, push the rubber boat alone. Definitely. Right? <laughs> so, oh. uh, uh, hearing your story, Ma'am Janet, I'm pretty sure um, a lot of interested students right now that are watching our program would really, we are really confident no, that our um, faculty members are not just uh, teaching based on books or if not based on, um, you know, instructional resources, but really based on experiences. And if I may say near death experiences, <laughs> risky, <laughs> risky, um, risky uh, yeah, experiences. Um, I think you could call it calculated risk. Calculated risk. Yeah. yeah and I think, in fact, diving is a calculated risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Mom Janet, when it comes now with our students, of course, definitely you would also have to let them experience this one. Um, what are the feedback that you have received so far about their experience? And then um, perhaps you have already graduates or alumna <laughs> of, or alumni of the institute have also been making their waves in the field. So can you share more about this? Mom? Okay, let me first talk about our graduate, the undergrad. Yeah. Um, the first batch, we just gradu we graduated only three. Three. Um, and so, um, two are already hired. The other one is went to grad school in UPMSI. Mm -mm. And so, that's like, they were trained very well. It's just unlucky that they were, you know, we had that COVID thing in between. Mm. And so, long before the end of, you know, the... Um, the beginning of face to face, students were already employing, uh, imploring us, please, can we come home? You know, we want <laughs> to be there. And they actually arrived. And I said, guys, you're not supposed to come in the campus because I'll be in, you know. There's a protocol yeah. to follow. And so they're, they're lucky, I guess, because right in front of us is our field lab. So we have, we do our exercises, go and jump over there. If we do mangrove exercises, that's, we have a mangrove garden. And if they want to do experiments, we have a, you know, aquaculture facility. And so um, there's a lot of field work. Um, the first batch actually was like, um, they have this funny picture wherein they were like, they were supposed to be tired and they were hanging mm -hmm. over the rubber boat and stuff. <laughs> But they find it fun. But it's so cute. <laughs> yeah, it's so actually fun, but it's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, so it seems, ma'am, that um, aside from your interest, no, there's also this perseverance and persistence in the field. What are the academic requirements when they plan to enroll at the institute, especially our senior high school students planning to take environmental science or marine biology? Do they? Are you strand specific? Do they have to be from STEM? Do you do interviews? Do you have an entrance examination? Actually, um, we, the requirement is STEM. Mm -mm. So STEM graduate. Yes. Do you yes. have an, an interview or like an examination? Um, we do um, an interview. Interview. Um, some uh, a faculty an interview with any other faculty, mm -mm. and sometimes. Like this year, we were inundated because we had mm. like 35 or so applicants, and there's just five of us, you know? <laughs> and it was COVID time, so it yeah. was quite difficult. So sometimes, like, we held it um, online um, just to be able to talk to students because sometimes uh, there's a lot of 
misconception that marine biology is actually a glamour job. <laughs> All they can think about is clear seas, you know, and yeah. this glamorous diving. I say, no, most of the time you can't see what's in front of you. Okay. So, um, how about for your graduate programs, uh, Ma'am Janet? What are the academic requirements? Uh, do they have to be graduate of BS Bio or you're not that course specific? Course specific. Mm -mm. Um, because you're already talking about a graduate level. Um, and graduate level is not lectures anymore by the teachers. You actually do your seminars to the teachers. Mm. And so this is, you know, and then some cases your teachers may require you for original research, a small one. Yeah. And so um, you have to have an undergraduate in the field. Um, sometimes we get uh, graduates of geology uh, in marine science but they're not trained in scientific writing, so we have to train them again in that. So there's a deficiency, but if you're coming in straight from chemistry, biology, um, no, problem, no problem, particularly with environmental science. But if you're in marine biology, you have to have to be from the field of biology, biology. marine biology, um, fishery sometimes, you. Sometimes, yeah. but you may have some difficulty. Right. So if there are, there are interested in Rollis, ma'am, what are the phone numbers to so dial? Do you have a Facebook page? Um, what is the email to contact? Um, best is to contact um, IEMS at su.edu.ph. Um, since we're isolated here, <laughs> sometimes a little wind cuts off our you know phone line. Yeah. So it's a little bit erratic, but... Email is the best way. Yeah. Um, you can also contact our recruitment office, which yeah. is the best way because they just forward your emails to us. And of course, our website, that's www.su.edu.ph. Ma'am Janet, we have um, talked a lot of things already. And as a scientist, uh, I believe that you are well published and you have surveyed a lot of areas around and in the nearby regions in the country. What do you think is, um, it, in your um, setup right now, age, context, you know, and uh, position, um, what is your dream project that you, you really want to do? What's the dream project of a Janet Estacion? To, con uh, to do further work yeah. in, for my, my clams, you know, do actually pathology work to, like, um, broaden, is doing histopathology requires a lot of equipment and mm. so it's very very difficult to continue um, it's actually studying diseases of marine organisms um, and so that would be interesting um, you know if you give me a lot of money then <laughs> i'll set up the lab just very shortly ma'am um, this histopathology what would be its major significance for for us um actually not directly to humans but in, in a way, um, because let's say, for example, um, you're eating food that has poisons or has some pathogens in it, mm, okay. you know. Um, I was trained in Australia, and they're very, very strict with diseases over there. Um, and so I learned from uh, uh, my supervisor was actually from a veterinary uh, vet, but his PhD was on pathology. Mm -mm. And they were they're so very strict about diseases, and so there's there's um, a theory that the 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 way our aquaculture industry actually you know just fell apart because of diseases. So that would be its major importance. Yes, and also um, diseases is like um, the least studied. Yeah. For for marine organisms. Uh, even for our terrestrial animals, even for mammals. And so it's a crossover. And uh, I was, by the way, I was, I will just plug this in. <laughs> Go ahead, ma'am. I was, I was previously teaching um, full-time at biology department. And I used to challenge my students um, na, who were going to be doctors. Mm -mm. And I know they're probably aware of this. I told them I'm still waiting for an MD, PhD from my students. Wow. Somebody who really will study the medicine, the diseases, 
And so we we sort of can study the broader things about right. you know tropical diseases. Mm -mm. And so that would be great. Wow. That's um, also a dream. <laughs> Dr. Janet, as much as we would love to um, extend our conversation, but we are running out of time. So this would be my final question for you as we close this conversation. Um, Dr. Stashon, of course, no, we were all impacted by the pandemic in one way or the other. And as many scientists would put it, the pandemic is an indication of how fractured our relationship is with our with the environment. So, um, if you were to share your biggest lesson uh, during the pandemic with respect to um, sustainable development about the environment, our ecosystem, what would it be, ma'am? Um, the pandemic actually created a lot of problems because, for example, let me cite the case in Apple that their their driving industry is actually tourism. Mm -mm. And so when the tourists stopped coming, they did not have e extra income. Yeah. They cannot go to the mainland. What did they do? They fished. Mm. And so there was a big fishing pressure. And so the, there was a, an, a decrease in the biomass of the fish. And so that's a big impact to them, uh, you know, as for the marine environment itself. Meanwhile, for Filipinos, I think, I believe we're very, very res resilient. So if you notice during the COVID, we had, you know, online sales, we had, <laughs> you know, uh, Grab become yes, popular, and, you know, and stuff like this. So I think we, 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 you know, there's impact, but I believe in the resilience of Filipinos. That's so beautiful, Dr. Janet. And of course, no, to end our um, program tonight, I would agree no, that we are resilient. And especially here in Siliman University, we are resilient in any wave of challenges because we know that we stand on a solid rock. And that's the way, the truth, and the light. Thank you for joining our episode tonight, and to God be the glory. Hey there, Salimanians! Dagang salamat for joining our episode tonight. Support our Facebook page. It's called Hashtag Siliman. We also have a YouTube channel. It's still called Hashtag Siliman. Don't forget to click the notification bell for you to be updated with our recent posts. We air every Monday, 8 p.m. And uh, replays are every Tuesday before the noontime news, Saturday, after the noontime news. This has been Joshua Soldivillo and on behalf of Roland Faith by Losses, see you next week only here on Hashtag Cinnamon!